Okay, hi everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, today we're gonna be talking about how to train a supervised learning model with unstructured text data. Um, does anybody in the room have any data with text? Okay, great, so a lot of people have text data. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about how we can build a model with text data, how we can get better accuracy using these text columns, um, and also how do we understand the data. So how do we understand our model that's built with text data, which can be um, complicated. So I'm Megan Kirka, I'm a customer data scientist here at H2O, um, and today we're gonna be talking about using uh, natural language processing with H2O um, for the purpose of training a supervised learning model. I only have a few slides. I'm gonna focus on a demo today uh, using H2O. Our use case is going to be uh, using Amazon Fine Food Reviews. So we have about 500,000 food reviews. I've trimmed it down to 100,000 for the demo. <clears throat> and the data looks like this. So we're gonna have a product ID, a user ID or customer ID, a helpfulness numerator, which is how many people found the review helpful, a helpfulness denominator, which is how many people indicated that was helpful or not helpful. Uh, a score, so that rating from one to five, anyone familiar with Amazon, this would be the five star rating. Uh, a summary of the review, and then the actual review. So we're gonna try to use this data to predict whether or not um, somebody left a positive or negative review based on, on this food product. And that's gonna be our goal today. The data set is public, it's a Kaggle data set, and the notebook I'm gonna be using today is also public, and I'll share the links at the end of the talk if you wanna try it yourself. All right. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Okay, all right, today we're gonna to be using Python and H2O to train a um, supervised learning model. And we're gonna do a few different models to see if we can prove our accuracy. All right, I'm gonna start by importing H2O library and starting up an H2O cluster. All right. We see that a cluster is up, I see the version, and I'm gonna import my Amazon reviews. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a new column that indicates that the review is positive. So we saw that we had the score, which is one through five. Um, I'm gonna add my target column or response column, which says if anyone that rates at four or five, it's gonna be positive. Anyone less, it's non-positive. All right. Okay, and here I'm just taking a look at the count. So it looks like most people leave positive reviews. Um, maybe about a quarter of the people you leave negative reviews. So it's, it's more common in this case for a positive review. Now in order to do this problem, we're gonna start by training a baseline model without any text data. I wanna use this to compare. How much ac more accurate can we get if we use the text data? Okay. So I'm just gonna split my data up into training and testing and train a gradient boosting machine with H2O. It just finished building on about 100,000 records, and we have a validation data AUC of 0.61. So we're not that accurate using the other columns, like the user ID, the product ID, the time. Um, and we can see with the confusion matrix that we have about 91% error in predicting non-positive reviews. So we're pretty bad at predicting right now. Um, but I wanna leverage the text data because I, if I were looking at the reviews and reading them, I could tell you if it was a positive or a negative review. So we know the answer is there, we just wanna be able to automate it. Can the machine predict whether or not it's positive or negative? Okay. And here we can see the variable importance of that baseline GBM. So the most important variable is the helpfulness numerator. I wanna know a little bit more about that. What about the helpfulness numerator indicates if it's positive or negative? Here I'm gonna use a partial dependency plot which will show me the relationship between the variable helpfulness numerator and the response column or the prediction. So it looks to me like people, or reviews rather, with a high helpfulness numerator are more likely to be positive. So people rate a review as po uh, helpful if it's a positive review in this data set. All right, now we're gonna start adding some text data. Let's see how we do. This this function here is gonna take my reviews and it's gonna to tokenize it. And what tokenizing does is it's gonna separate the uh, reviews into words and we're also gonna filter out some non-helpful words. So these would be called stop words. They're words like and, the, of. 
they're not going to add any meaningful information to the reviews. We're going to get rid of them. And the reason why we're doing this tokenizing is we want to train a word-to-vec model. Now, the goal of a word-to-vec model is to, um, to map the words to a vector space. Okay. The idea here is that words that share the same context have similar semantic meanings. All right. Now, the reason why we would want to train a word-to-vec model would be to um, have now a series of numbers that represent each word rather than a string. Supervised learning models have a much easier time understanding numbers than they do strings. They don't see, for example, the similarity between good and great, but they'll see similarities between numbers. All right. I've already trained my word-to-vec model. I'm just going to import it. And what we can do with our word-to-vec model is do a sanity check on it. How well did it understand the semantic meanings of the words? One of the things we can do since we're mapping each word to a vector space is calculate the cosine distance between all other words. So words that are synonyms will have a small distance. In this case, I want to find the, or the synonyms for coffee in this data set. It's going to give me the five, top five synonyms for coffee. And we can see that they're coffee spelled wrong. Starbucks, coffees, espresso, and espresso. So they're all coffee-related terms. Now, it found this just by using the reviews in the data and figuring out what words were next to coffee. We're also going to try to figure out what synonyms are for stale, based on the data. All right. OK, so we have rancid, unedible, moldy, expired, and expiration spelled wrong. So it's even picking up on the misspellings. And this is unsupervised. I just gave it some data, some text data, and it's finding out all of these relationships between the words. Um, does anyone want to throw out a word to find synonyms for? Company. Sorry? Company. Company? OK, it's food data, so maybe it won't be that good. Company was the. OK, relations, inquiry, contacting, agreeing, apologetic. Now, this is in food reviews. So I could see company and apologetic maybe being in the same review. All right. Now, our next step is we now have a word vector per word. We're going to aggregate that by review, taking an average of all the vectors. Because what we want in the end is a vector representing each review in, num in a num numeric vector. And I'm just going to add that back to my original data. And you can see here are the word vectors. We, in this case, have 100 numbers. And we're going to train a new model with the embeddings, the word embeddings. The GBM model is building, and we're going to compare the AUC from our baseline model with our new model, the only difference being that I've now added word embeddings. So we see a pretty big jump in accuracy from 0 0.61 to 0 0.874 using the text data from the reviews. And if we take a look at the Confucian matrix, um, we can see here that now what, what was once the error of about 90%, we've lowered to 56%. So it's still not great, but it's much, much better at predicting positive or non-positive reviews. Now, one other thing we can try to add is the fact that it has a summary column. So there is one other text column called summary. And this is summarizing the review. If you're familiar with Amazon, whenever you see a review, you'll see the summary on the top and then the full review below. So we're going to also add the word embeddings from the summary using our same word to vec model. Right. And we're going to see if we can get a little bit better accuracy by now including the word embeddings from summary. We're training a model. All right. And the only difference, again, is that it has these additional word embeddings. And now we're going to compare the baseline AUC, the AUC for the GBM model with the review word embeddings, and the GBM with the summary and review embeddings. And we can see that, again, we've jumped up a little bit more from 0.874 to 0.911. So it's getting even more accurate. So the summary also has some information about whether or not it was positive. And that makes sense, because usually when you read a review, you can tell from the summary whether or not someone liked it or didn't. All right. But one of the things we want to do is not just build an accurate model with text. We also want to be able to understand the model. Well, how is it making the decisions it's making? Does it make sense? So I'm going to take a look again at that variable importance chart. And notice now with our best model, our final model, 
all of the top 10 variables are word embeddings except for one, which is the helpfulness denominator. So the word embeddings are really important in this model. Whatever the semantic meanings are in this, in this review is very important. And you can notice that the top two are both related to the C43. So this is one of the entries in this word embeddings, the 43rd. And it's really important for whatever reason in predicting whether or not a review is positive or non-positive. Um, we want to understand what does C43 mean? Does this make sense? Um, I don't know what C43 means, so let's dig in a little bit more. We're going to use, again, our partial dependency plots. And again, this is going to show me the relationship between C43 and the model's prediction. All right. So if we can look here, we can see the red line is showing me the average prediction per different values of C43. Um, in this case, it's showing me that if C43 is particularly low, the likelihood that it's a good review is much lower. So for whatever reason, maybe words with a low C43 value are indicating that it's a, it's a bad review. So I'm going to dig in a little bit further and figure out what words have a low C43 value. Okay. So here I'm getting the words, and I'm going to get C43 for each word. I'm going to figure out if there's something interesting about these words. And if we take a look at the histogram of C43, we can see that um, there is a tail here, like words with less than negative one, that's really low. So let's dig into those words. All right. All right, so here are our words. Answered, contacted, credit, email, emails, expiration, expired, phone, refund, refunded, wrap. So a lot of these definitely sound like they're related to somebody contacting for a refund, contacting the company, something went wrong. So I definitely could see why in this particular situation these may be related to negative reviews. Um, probably most people don't contact the company if they really like the product. The other one, if we look a little, scroll a little down, is Salmonella. So as I mentioned, this is food reviews. So Salmonella is particularly bad in a review. Right? And it's catching that. It's catching that these, these particular words that have a really low C43 value are somehow negative in this context. So if I trained a different model on totally new data, I could see a completely different, different um, pattern come up. Okay. All right. So I want to finish up the lightning talk trying to predict uh, on totally new reviews that it hasn't seen before. I want to see how much this model can generalize. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try it on two new reviews. So the first one's going to be these chips are delicious, salty, sweet, with a hint of spice. Um, obviously, this is a positive review. Now, the second one's going to be negative. It's quite tasteless, and they make you order so many. I am stuck with 12 bags of this tasteless stuff. So we're going to try to be able to predict. Hopefully, the model can tell us if it's a positive or negative review, and, and hopefully very clearly, because these are both very positive or very negative. Hmm. What I've written here is just a little function that's going to do all of those preprocessing steps we've done before. So it's going to take the um, words in the review and tokenize them and get the word embeddings. It's going to do the same thing for summary. And then it's going to predict using our GBM model, our final GBM model with the highest accuracy. And here's my good review, the chips are delicious, and my bad review, which is um, quite tasteless. And we're going to run this predict column, and hopefully we see that the good review gets a high probability of, um, high probability of a positive review, and the bad review has a low probability. Um, and let's just let this run. So we finished the, the good review, and we can see that the prediction is one. It's true that it's a good review. And the probability is about 86%. So it was pretty confident in the model that this was a good review. Um, for the bad review, let's see what it comes up with. It has a really low probability of being good, only 6%. So in this case, it's also pretty confident that it was a bad review. Um, so this is how we can use these concepts of natural language processing and supervised learning. Again, the idea is that these texts, this text data is very um, hard for a supervised learning model to understand, but converting them to numbers makes it much more accurate. So we have word to vec model in the H2O platform, H2O core. You're, uh, feel free to try this out on your own. Um, and it will train a word to vec model. You can use it to find synonyms. You can transform your text data into numeric vectors with it, and then finally predict. Um, and we also produce a mojo for these word to vec models. It's a Java object that represents the word to vec model, which can be used in production. Um, all right, 
and I'm just going to pull up here the links. So you can see here um, we have the Word to Vec documentation and also the Jupyter Notebook that I just showed. So if you do want to play around with it and try it yourself, you can. Those were real Amazon reviews. Um, so try it out and see what you find. Um, I did end a little bit earlier than I thought, so I think we can take some questions on Slido. Oh, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Hi. So, very, very good question. How much text is required, and can we use an existing Word to Vec model? Um, how much text is required? The the be more the better. But what you can do, if your goal is a supervised learning problem, is to try it on whatever data you have and see how accurate you are. Maybe as time goes on and you've gathered more data, train it again and see if you get a little bit more accuracy. If there is minimal improvement, then you probably have enough data. Um, can you use an existing word to vec model trained on, from a different corpus? Yes, you can, and I would actually recommend that. Um, with our word to vec implementation, you can actually take an existing word to vec model or glove model and import it into H2O and use that as well. And that's even uh, really interesting because um, in our case, we had specific food data. So we may find specific information or like interesting meanings because it's food-based. But you might also want to use a model trained on a huge news corpus, for example, just to get that robustness. Um, and it's definitely possible. I would recommend doing that um, with H2O. Can you do simple TFIDF instead of word to vac Yes, you can. And actually, in this room later today, there's going to be a sparkling water lab where they're going to use that same Amazon food review data and run a train TFIDF on it. So if you are interested in seeing how that works, um, stay later on for the sparkling water lab. OK, and do you guys have a doc to vac estimator? Um, no, we don't have that right now, but we, we plan to add more natural language processing techniques um, in the future. And then the last one, do you expect LSTM or RNN will perform better or worse than GBM? Uh, I don't want to speculate. I haven't tried it on this data. But I will say that GBM does perform very, very well on transactional data. It usually, if you have enough data, it, it performs um, one of the best algorithms. So that's, that's it. OK. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You may not have seen um, all of the questions. Oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, I didn't put them in there because we're running behind. But Megan is going to be available afterwards to answer any questions that you have. Okay, yeah. Thank you.